Our last paper on jumping biomechanics is another one on footwear effects on uh, jumping performance. This is Harry et al. 2015, titled Effects of Footwear Condition on Maximal Jumping Performance. Um, here they were studying the biomechanics and uh, the performance of two types of jumps. They did a, a counter movement jump for max height and a standing long jump for uh, max distance. And they had uh, 15 healthy young men who, who performed those, those jumps and participated in the study. Uh, both the jumps were done uh, with uh, free arm swing. So, so doing whatever depth of counter movement you wanted and uh, swinging the arms how, however you wanted. Um, they compared performance there in uh, three different footwear conditions. And this is an important distinction from uh, some of the previous studies on footwear that we've um, examined. Most of the previous studies on footwear have compared uh, differences in uh, certain parts of a shoe, like the or certain characteristics of a shoe. Um, the, the marathon uh, running shoe study is, is a little bit different because there they were comparing different uh, types of shoes. Um, but in, in many of the previous studies, we've been comparing shoes that differed on mass or differed on cushioning or differed on the presence of a carbon fiber plate. Um, here they were literally comparing different types of shoes. So like wholly different uh, varieties of shoes that you could go and, and buy in like a shoe store and, and use for, uh, for exercise and running and training and, and, and various other things. Um, the three shoes that they compared were not actually three shoes, they were three footwear conditions. There's only two types of shoes. Um, reason there is because one of the conditions was barefoot, no shoes. So performing the jumps with, with nothing on your feet, just barefoot. Um, in another condition, the participants did the jumps with uh, what's called a minimal shoe or a minimalist shoe um, made by Vibram here. And in the, the last condition, they did the jumps in a, what they refer to here as a, a cross training shoe, which is kind of a typical uh, New Balance shoe for exercise. Um, so a barefoot condition, uh, a minimal shoe condition, and a cross training kind of typical shoe condition. Um, I pulled up pictures of, uh, of these shoes that they used to, to give you an idea of what we were working with here. Um, I don't know if it was this particular Vibram shoe, but it, it likely looked something like this. Um, Vibram was a company that made um, shoes like this, or I would, I'm not sure I would actually call this a shoe, it's more of a, a foot covering like this, that I believe was originally uh, designed and intended for like surfing and uh, walking around on like slippery uh, wet surfaces, like uh, the decks of boats or uh, uh, docks and, and things of that nature. Um, Vibram then noticed that um, people sometimes ran in these shoes and a lot of people liked running in these shoes. And this was around the time that like the, uh, the minimalist boom in, in shoes happened. This was, you know, ballpark maybe 10-ish or so years ago. And around that time, these shoes started getting pretty popular for uh, running, for using these shoes to, to run. And a lot of companies, a lot of major uh, footwear vendors started making uh, what were called minimalist shoes, which are shoes that uh, were very thin, very light, didn't have a great deal of cushioning, if any cushioning under the heel, and were largely just a shoe intended to, to protect your foot from uh, stepping on, on something sharp and to give you a, a little bit of traction with, with the ground, but not really intended to have any substantial uh, amount of cushioning or, or stiffness along the midsole there. Okay. Um, these shoes were pretty popular for a while. I think they're still uh, pretty popular amongst like CrossFit type activities. I don't see them around for uh, for running quite as at least nearly as much as I used to, at least in the, the running circles uh, that I uh, frequent. So they were pretty popular for running for a while. You don't see them so much anymore. Um, Vibram lost a, a lawsuit over these shoes maybe like six or seven years ago or so over some of the, the health claims that they were making about the shoes that, that are not really substantiated by science. So maybe that's perhaps why they're not quite as popular as they used to be, but these were quite popular as uh, running shoes for, uh, for quite a while. Um, the New Balance shoe is your more typical, like uh, I wouldn't necessarily call this a running shoe, but your more typical like exercise type shoe. I would actually call this a, a lawn mowing shoe, um, but this is just kind of a typical shoe for, uh, for moving around and, and for doing just a non-specific exercise with, with a large amount of cushioning uh, under the heel there and, and along the midsole there. So uh, standing long jumps and uh, counter movement jumps uh, for height, um, barefoot, uh, same thing in these minimalist shoes and same thing in these uh, sort of uh, traditional cross training type shoes. Okay. Um, so this study in just in terms of the general design before we get into the results is in a little bit of contrast to some of the other jumping studies and running studies that we've examined here where they're leaning way towards like what I would call the practical side of things where comparing people's performance when they're allowed to perform however they want um, using wholly different types of shoes, right? Um, a contrast to this would be, let's suppose we did a study um, on 
uh, vertical jump heights or you know whatever task let's just use vertical jump height as an example um, in different shoes where we adjusted the shoes to kind of control for some confounders there like uh, when we're barefoot versus in minimal shoes versus cross training shoes those shoes have different masses we think mass might affect performance so then we might add mass to these other two conditions to to keep mass the same uh, between uh, between these footwear conditions. Okay. Um, same thing for arm swing, like for whatever reason I might swing my arms differently when I do jumps in these uh, three different shoes and so maybe I should control for that, maybe I should make the subjects uh, swing their arms the same way in all the shoes, or maybe I should make them uh, counter down to the same depth in the counter movement between the different shoes. Right? They didn't do that here in, in, in this uh, particular study and those are some, not all those things and not any of those things specifically, but some of those things were, were done as like controls in some of the other studies we've looked at. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be lacking those things in this particular study. And this can actually be a strength of the study because, like I said, it leans towards an element of practicality. Um, if I'm going to go out and perform and try to jump as high as I can or jump as far as I can, and I want to know, well, should I, should I wear this minimalist shoe or should I, should I try something like this cross-training shoe, um, I'm not going to go out and use my minimal shoes and add mass to them to make them weigh as much as the cross-training shoe. Right? I'm going to go out and use either the cross-training shoe or the minimalist shoe as, as I buy them as, I come off, as they come off the shelf. Right? So having information on how people perform in these whole different footwear conditions is, is useful despite the fact that these uh, conditions differ on a variety of kind of smaller scale details of the shoes. They differ on mass, they differ on cushioning, they differ on bending stiffness, maybe they differ on comfort level, you know, all, all sorts of different uh, uh, kind of smaller scale variables there that could affect somebody's performance in the shoes. But things that are uh, not really things that an individual might manipulate when they're using those shoes. So an element of practicality here in this study that maybe isn't uh, present in, in what would typically be considered a more controlled scientific study. Uh, same deal on things like the arm swing and the counter movement squat depth. Um, do those things affect the distance that somebody jumps to in terms of height or the distance that somebody jumps to in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, how far you jump? Yeah, sure, those, those things can affect things. The style and mechanics that you use to jump have, have an effect on those things. And so if I control for those things, then I'm kind of scientifically gaining some control, but I'm losing a little bit of practicality, right? When I go out and jump in my minimal shoes versus my cross training shoes, I'm not going to say, well, when I jumped into minimal shoes, I swung my arms a certain way. And so I'm going to make sure I swing my arms that same way in the cross training shoes. And so I can make sure I can, can make a faithful comparison here between these two shoes. No, my goal is to perform as best as I can. If I swing my arms or do my squat a little bit different in these shoes versus these shoes, if it improves my performance, then, then that's my goal, right? So again, here, an element of practicality, um, possibly at the expense of, of a little bit of, of, of control in terms of inferring, well, what exactly was different about these shoes or these conditions that was, uh, that was causing these, any potential differences in the outcome variables. But uh, gaining uh, some confidence in obtaining data in your lab that are more representative of how people might actually move outside of the lab when, when they perform these movements in, in these footwear conditions. So key results here were um, actually, in most cases, an absence of results. Um, this were in uh, figure one is the average uh, vertical jump height, the average uh, counter movement jump height um, in the barefoot shoes and in the minimal shoes in the middle and in the uh, typical uh, cross training shoes on the right. And you can see on average, not a whole lot of difference there. You know, maybe a, you know, if you get real picky, maybe you know, a few millimeters here and there. But statistically, no significant differences between the, the jump heights that the individuals reached in these three shoes on average. Um, similar story here for the uh, distance jumped in the standing long jumps. And again, if you look closely, yeah, maybe on average some you know, small changes there on the order of like millimeters, but no, no large, meaningful, statistically significant differences between these footwear conditions and in how far people jumped in these different shoes. Okay. So take home message there would be if you're concerned with performance, if you're trying to jump as high as you can or jump as far as you can, if that's important for your, uh, for your sport, then at least among these different footwear conditions that, that are comparing shoes that differ, footwear conditions that differ by quite a bit, the type of shoe that you wear for that may not matter all that much. Okay? You can, it seems like you've, at least you have the potential, at least on average, to perform just as well um, regardless of which uh, type of shoe you're wearing here. Um, where they did see some differences, and this gets into uh, what's here in uh, table one and uh, table two, and later on down here in uh, table three. Um, here, 
in table one, they were looking at some biomechanics variables. So like peak ground reaction forces, uh, duration of different phases of the movement, and you know, some, some other uh, uh, metrics here of, of ground reaction forces. Um, no real large substantive, again, meaningful differences there in terms of the biomechanics of the movement. Um, with, which might be expected since the performance didn't, didn't differ significantly between, between the different footwear conditions. Um, where they did see some differences was down here in uh, table one and table two, which I won't get into the, the nitty gritty details of just because there's a lot of, lot of numbers here, a lot of data. Um, these are uh, measures of the uh, muscle activation level um, as, as assessed by electromyography sensors, by those EMG sensors placed on, on the skin above muscles um, on the leg. Here they were looking at some hamstring muscles and some calf muscles and uh, some, some, uh, some knee muscles, some quadriceps muscles there on, on, the, on the far right side. And here they did see some differences. That's what these kind of funny looking symbols that you see kind of peppered about uh, the results table here in these, uh, in these uh, tables two and three, which is summarizing the EMG results or the muscle activity results. Um, there they did see some differences in uh, terms of which muscles were activated when and, and to what extent when the individuals performed uh, the jumps with these uh, different footwear conditions. Okay. So overall kind of take home message here, um, no substantial differences in performance and no substantial differences in biomechanics, but some differences in the activity of the muscles used to exhibit those biomechanics and used to, to exhibit those performances. So you use the muscles, at least on the basis of the EMG data, um, a little bit differently in the different shoe conditions to achieve about the same purpose. Okay. Um, there's some elements there of uh, speaking to motor control that get kind of outside the scope of this biomechanics class that I won't uh, touch on too, too, in too much detail here, but it kind of speaks to the versatility and, and flexibility of human motor control that we can use our, our complicated uh, muscle, system of muscles here in, in lots of different ways to achieve a, a good performance in lots of different ways. Um, practical application here for sports, um, again, if you are concerned with performance, maybe just wear the shoe that you think is most comfortable. Maybe just wear the shoe that you're used to. So it seems at least in, in terms of short-term uh, immediate improvements in performance here by, by trying these different footwear conditions, it really didn't make much of a difference for jump height or for uh, jumping distance. Um, the element of, of muscle activity here um, and I'm, I'm speculating a bit here. This isn't really something that they, they speak too strongly on and conclude too strongly on in the paper. Um, but the um, activation levels here of the muscles, um, that's still quite a long ways away from inferring things like the, uh, the load on fibers or strain on tendons and stuff like that. So it's, it's at best kind of a, an estimate of like how, how, how heavily loaded mechanically a muscle might be. But it can certainly give you maybe, maybe, maybe a first place to start there in terms of how, how taxing were these jumping conditions in these different shoes on these different muscles. So if you have somebody that is struggling with their jumping performance and they want to know, well, well wearing these, these different types of shoes here help, um, unless it's something that's like adding a carbon fiber plate like we saw in the previous study, at least on the basis of this study, it may not actually help you too much. Um, if you have somebody that's having, uh, say, comfort issues or injury issues or, or pain issues when they're jumping, then you might think about changing uh, the footwear condition because it looks like it does affect the, uh, the pattern and, and the timing and just overall uh, control of, of the muscles and perhaps the loading of the muscles uh, in, in terms of uh, how, how, the, how those muscles are contributing to uh, performance in, in, in jumping here. So unlikely, and so changing these different footwear conditions, unlikely maybe to affect performance, but possibly could have an effect on how that performance is achieved in terms of which, which muscles are involved and which muscles are, are loaded relatively heavily versus not so heavy compared to um, other feasible footwear conditions. Okay, that is it for today. This uh, will be a, a short one, one of our shorter ones on uh, jumping biomechanics. Um, again, this is the last study, the 10th and final study on the jumping section of class and the uh, 20th and final study in kind of this first uh, chunk of class where we will um, cover the, the, the material that's on the um, uh, first exam coming up on Friday.